the the stats of the web uh, the phone usage it's it's very difficult to justify that cost for a service that in essence is is dying as a whole hello and welcome to behind the screens it at nd the podcast that takes you behind the scenes of the it solutions consultants at the university of notre dame here, we explore the challenges they face, the innovative solutions they provide, and the tips and tricks that can help you make the most out of your technology. I'm Krista. I am the Marketing and Communications Manager for the Office of Information Technology here at Notre Dame. And I'm Scooter, Director of IT for the College of Arts and Letters. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Our guest today is John Boozy, Senior Director of OIT's University Network and Telephony Services team. He's joining us to talk about the Wireless First initiative. Welcome, John. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Scooter. Yeah, before we start, John, could you tell us a little bit about your current role and the journey that brought you here? So I'm currently the Senior Director of Network and Telephony Services. Uh, been in this role since uh, right around 2017, but I've been with the university in the OIT since uh, 2000, and as Scooter is aware, I, when I first started with the OIT, I, I worked closely with his dad for, for a number of years. Um, but I, during that time, I worked through in different areas in, in engineering and then moved into management and architecture and ultimately to this point. Awesome. Excellent. So John, let me start by asking you, can you describe for us what is wireless first and how is it different from say wireless only? What are, what are we doing here? Yes, it's uh, it's a very good question. And yes, it is wireless first, not wireless only, but uh, it, yeah, I think explaining what, what wireless first is, is a very important, but even more important is explaining why we're, why we're doing this. But the, the crust of wireless first really is no different than what everyone has already done at home. Uh, you think about uh, everyone's homes when the internet first became popular. Everyone had modems uh, in their in their homes and uh, connected to their physical computers, wires, um, home phones. Um, then, as technology advanced, we had broadband and cable modems, but it was still then wired into everyone's computer to the point we are today, where Everyone is wireless in their, their homes, not only for their computers, but TVs and other Internet of Things devices. And probably virtually everyone no longer has a home phone in their, in their home. Everything is wireless. So we're looking at doing the same thing here at the university and, and becoming uh, more reliant on the wireless technology that the university has invested in. Um, and very important, it is wireless first, it is not wireless only. There is always going to be needs for uh, wired connectivity, um, whether or not that's a, a life safety matter, uh, but more, one of the bigger drivers will be especially unique needs and high bandwidth type of things. Um, but getting to, uh, building upon that and, and why are we doing wireless first? And it's really, we are being good stewards of the university's resources. Um, the university has been very generous in uh, what it has provided to be able to build out a, a robust network environment on campus and uh, has invested significantly in making improvements into the wireless environment uh, across campus over the last five to six years. Um, and uh, has also been very generous in, in our staffing cycles to be able to support that. Uh, but if we, as we think about the long-term direction of the university uh, is, is how do we best take that and provide the needs for the university? I think one of the, the important lessons we learned with COVID was it showed how critical uh, wireless connectivity was to operations and being able to be flexible and move mm -hmm. around and people were not in one place, they were in, in multiple locations. Uh, and we were fortunate to be in a position where we were we were able to support that as best we could at that point. Uh, but now we're strategically going into that direction to provide that flexibility for people. That's, yeah. 
Yeah, sounds like it'd be a massive undertaking. Where where do we even start uh, with it, with something like this? Uh, it it actually it started five or six years ago. Really, honestly, it, uh, so when we uh, for the longest time wireless uh, on campus, and when I say wireless, it, it can mean a lot of different things. There's Wi-Fi, there's cellular. Uh, this this uh, specific example, we're we're talking Wi-Fi. Uh, the cellular is kind of out of our control. We work with Crown Castle and the carriers, but we we do not have direct control of of that direction. But on the Wi-Fi, we've made a consider uh, considerable effort in the last five or six years to upgrade the Wi-Fi throughout campus. Uh, when we started this effort, it was really just from a coverage perspective. We got a Wi-Fi signal to, to people, and but whether or not it was usable was hit or miss. And, and we knew that, and I'm sure everyone's listening would, would agree to that. Uh, but we redesigned all of the Wi-Fi and all of the buildings on campus and tremendously increased the density uh, to give a, a perspective. Um, when we started this effort, we had approximately 2,500 access points on campus. Today, we have over 12,000. Wow. So, so wow. that, that ladders up to um, being able to remove wired connections yes. and then move away from phones. Yes. So it's, it's like a wireless versus like a three. Three, three yes. Moving away from from uh, wired connections and as well as getting, dis cutting the cord per se for mm -hmm. our, our physical phones on campus. Um, it, it's, it, it, they're all, all the, all the same. So let, let's let's go into the infrastructure side a little yeah. bit. So I mean, you just yeah. confirmed for us. We're talking infrastructure, we're talking computers, and we're talking phones. Let's kind of take those in turn. Um, you mentioned that we increased the density of access points by like four times or more. Um, what sort of testing and troubleshooting had to happen to get us there? And and uh, what does troubleshooting continue to look like? Troubleshooting will always be key, mm -hmm. it, and then. And it's really, a, it's an important perspective, not just on, on wireless, but even on wired. But um, on the, the wireless, we have we took a, a very uh, diligent uh, uh, angle at it and planning out how the Wi-Fi would be designed and laid out from an RF perspective. I mean, we measured how the signal goes through walls. I mean, we had people out measuring that through the walls. Uh, and then the more important part was after we would upgrade a building, we would go back through and walk around doing surveys to verify what we're seeing. Was that what we thought we were going to see? Um, as it relates to, to being able to support voice, that kind of takes wireless connectivity to another level. Uh, data, data connections, you're surfing the web on a web browser, things like that. If there's any type of small blip retransmission, those the web browser that that connectivity can easily mask that that retry and, and users don't even notice that um, when you're on a call voice or zoom video mm -hmm. if there's any type of blip it it shows up in that audio and it's it's recognizable and oh. i think i think everybody here has had a cell phone conversation like, well, are you there? Are you there? Can you hear me? Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Right. Or that, that zoom message of your internet connections unstable. Yes. Kind of thing. Breaking yes. up. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So like speaking of that, then with all of the embedded IT support we have throughout campus, be it, um, you know, it, through the OIT or with the other colleges, what does troubleshooting look like for them moving forward and moving through this it is a, very much a joint effort. It's we are looking at uh, different opportunities to provide more visibility for uh, the staff, the distributed staff, to be able to see what uh, what the network is doing. Uh, but even more important is kind of building out, developing out uh, playbooks per se, so that uh, staff uh, knows troubleshooting troubleshooting steps to go through to to work through a problem as well as what data needs to be collected off of the machine to, to help pinpoint the data. Uh, knowing that that playbook, it's it's going to handle the majority of, of the cases. There's always going to be special use cases um, that will uh, require more uh, uh, additional revisits to the computer or, or more uh, in-depth troubleshooting. Uh, another angle that we're taking is we're working with the help desk. So to, today there are I couldn't even tell you how many, but 
way too many uh, troubleshooting knowledge base articles in ServiceNow mm -hmm. uh, to go through and work and work through that. So we are working with the help desk, going through all of all of those articles, getting them not only consolidated but cleaned up and mm -hmm. be in wow. a usable fashion. So so people are able to find information that they need um, and and easily follow it. Yeah, it's so important. I yeah. mean, we've, we've all had the frustration of finding 17 hits that all kind of point to the same thing, but yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. that'll be very valuable. Yeah, yeah. I, I had that exact experience just uh, last week. I was looking for an article and I knew it was there. I couldn't find it. But, yeah. Yep. yeah, and eliminating conflicting information, Yes. <laughs> those kinds of things. Yeah. So, so this, uh, the whole wireless first initiative brings to the question to the forefront about um, wired versus wireless. And we actually had a listener question as we prepared for this, this episode. They ask, for years, I have explained to individuals that the wired network is faster and more consistent connection than the wireless network. And when they've asked what it is and why I'm connecting that blue cable to their accessories. So what can I start saying now to educate those who still have the wired network available, but also excite them for the future of wireless first? I mean, how's that message going to change? Yeah, so so th that message has already started uh, to change. At one time, yes, wired connection was um, a better service, faster, uh, more reliable. Um, with advances in the wireless technology, uh, that the speed difference between a, a standard one gig wired connection and, and Wi-Fi is virtually the same today. And with some future upgrades we're going to be making in FY26, uh, uh, the, the Wi-Fi connections will actually provide a faster speed than the, the current one gig like, uh, wired connections that people see. Uh, as far as uh, stability, there's also the added benefit with the, the Wi-Fi connection. The way we, are, we have designed and laid out the Wi-Fi Today, if a person is on a wired connection and that network switch goes down, they're down. Uh, with the Wi-Fi, we design the Wi-Fi in buildings so that two APs cover every location uh, in a building. So if one AP goes down, users still have connect connectivity through the second AP. That's and good. we yeah. And we lay that out, too, so that those APs are going to different switches. So yeah. if a switch goes down service isn't completely down. So moving area. over to different access points yes. to keep that stable connection. Yes. But awesome. That, that, so that density is also providing us that redundancy. Correct. In, yeah. Correct. In, in addition like to just... Safety net. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. fabulous. That's fabulous. Great. So what are some of the challenges that we've seen so far? And, you know, what are, what are some of the challenges that we anticipate as we continue to, you know, move toward this initiative. Um, I know we, we talked about the work is complete, right? Yeah. With strengthening the yes. Wi-Fi indoors. Um, but yeah, so is there much left to do in that sense? Or <laughs> it's it's never ending. It is, it is never yeah. never Hold ending. On. Yes. Yeah. No, I think the the biggest challenges we face, uh, there's in my mind there are are two primary challenges we face. And one gets back to the topic of troubleshooting that we talked earlier is how critical that is and making sure we are all in sync on that because um, the the data has shown that the majority of quote unquote, and this isn't just for Wi-Fi, it's even on, on the wired side, but the, the majority of the quote unquote network problems isn't necessarily the network. It is uh, something going on with the device itself. Um, uh oh, John's preparing for a fight. Here. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> trying to trying to be careful on how I how I put that, but yeah, it's it's the the with with networking, the device has so much control in how things work that uh, a lot of, it, it will appear as if there's a problem with the network and yeah. there's something going on with the device. A, a good example of it is, um, and I wish I wish the message would be different, uh, but like when you're on a Zoom meeting. Um, uh, I'm sure all of us have experienced this where, where things kind of freeze up or hiccup and you'll see a message saying unstable network or, or something mm -hmm. to that effect. Um, well, the re reality is there, it could be an unstable network, but the reality is a lot of times it's resources on the computer. Um, I have personally had this where I've been on a zoom and I'm periodically getting that 
and in the background I'm running speed tests and I'm getting 400 megs through. Yeah. So mm, it's like, wow. I, I know it isn't the connection. And then when I dive in deeper, I see like something's going on and, and the memory's all being chewed up on my computer or something to that effect. All right. So you're recommending 64 gigs of RAM yeah. on every laptop. Yes, yes, and... yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll write the check. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Don't tell Matt Anderson I said that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's talk a little bit about desktop computers. I mean, in the simplest case, like yeah. you said, um, well, I say desktop computers, but just yeah. computers in general, we're talking about being wireless instead yeah. of wired first. Um, and you alluded to the fact that there would be some special cases. What are some of those... Um, I don't know that I want to call them exceptions, but what are some of those special cases where somebody would still prefer to have a wired connection? Um, special networks that we have, and uh, Mike Atkins, our, our architect, is, is uh, I love the way he always puts this, is because the question always comes up, well, what is a special network? And, mm -hmm. and as he as he put it, is the people that have a special network know they have a special network. <laughs> uh, uh, because it, it's it's not part of the standard yeah. Uh, standard network provided to campus and, and a special request has to be made to get things configured for it. So people are aware that they're, they have a, a, a special network. So those, those use cases stay unwired. Um, areas that uh, need high bandwidth, um, uh, research, um, uh, uh, audio, video production, things like that. Um, and apologize if, if getting back to that very first question, the why that's, Another, mm -hmm. another, another reason for this, another why for the wireless first is being better stewards with our resources mm -hmm. are going to allow us to redirect those people resources and dollar resources to further improve the bandwidth for those areas that truly need that high bandwidth. Um, we have a, another goal. We haven't been talking about it a whole lot, but we have another goal uh, that we've set for ourselves to be able to provide a hundred gig to people's desktops that truly need it. Uh, so this will help us achieve that as well. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Because yeah. then you're providing a hundred gig to. Yeah. Is that the edge? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So providing that, uh, you know, 10 or 20% of the population yes. instead of every single building, every single Correct. place. Yeah. Correct. That's fabulous. Um, yeah. So what's, so what's the exception process look like? Uh, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of, uh, video production machines down in the DPAC for FTT. Yeah. How do we make sure they get on the list? Yeah. So, so the, the, the ones that are in the obvious, yep, these are, are video research, things like that. There's really no exception, exception process for that. As we, as we, uh, move through campus and, and, um, start implementing this, it, that'll just be part of it. Yep. They, they will remain. Um, mm. we do have a, an exception process for people a, a everyday user who feels that they need to have uh, a wired connection and or feels that they need to keep their physical phone um, is the exception process is going to work very similar to um, the process that is in place for uni university owned cell phones. So uh, I think it was about 15 years ago, the university made a major effort to reduce the number of university owned cell phones um, on campus. And that exception process, if someone feels that they need one, uh, goes up through the dean or the VP of their department. Cool. So if their dean or VP agrees to it, then we will we will do that. Excellent. Yeah. Curious question. So in terms of what people are going to see, you know, those outside of IT, even um, one of the examples that comes to mind that we were chatting about is some of the networking closets. Are, are we going to oh. see like more space opening up because we're losing these wired connections? Yeah. And uh, We won't reduce the, the number of, of uh, network closets with this, but we are greatly reducing the amount of equipment in those closets. Uh, to, give, uh, to give an example, we did this in the ITC uh, a year ago, May, uh, and we we reduced the number of switches in all of our network co closets by 15. Yeah. Uh, and that's just Ooh. in the ITC. Yeah. And I can tell you that's been great because yeah. what did we replace them with? Nothing. S snacks. Yeah. Yeah. Snacks. There's snacks. Yes. Snacks. Yes. Snacks. Yeah. Snacks. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yes. 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 See, I didn't know this. this yeah. Is, this you come, is, yeah. come on over. Come <laughs> okay. over. Okay. Yeah. There's snacks in there. Yeah. Okay. See, we've got a network closet just down the hall from our office over okay. at O'Shaughnessy. Uh, so right. we, we, we start filling that with snacks. Yes. We have a, a snack closet. Okay. I like it. Uh, so, 
Uh, you've talked about how how troubleshooting is going to be sort of a, a partnership that yes. those of us that are out in the field are still going to be able to work with um, central with the central networking folks. What kind of tools will we have? I mean, right now we've got NetReg that we can see some information. Will that still exist? Will some other tool exist? What what how will we be able to help? Yeah, NetReg will will still exist. It's not going anywhere. Uh, we are um, currently uh, identifying a, a new tool for additional Wi-Fi. Uh, tools to for staff to use we uh we have a tool today but uh with the broadcam purchase of vmware uh they kind of they they have decided to uh end of life that product by their drastic price increase but mm. uh so we are we are right in the middle of uh identifying between a couple of different solutions what what we can use for that so. excellent thanks yeah. excellent so let's talk about phones as we were chatting the other day you gave us some rather mind-blowing stats about phone usage. Could yes. you tell our listeners what's going on with phone usage uh, on campus? Not a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's why and, we're here. And huh? that is, <laughs> then that is, that is, uh, that is a reality. So when COVID hit our, the phone, uh, traffic in and out of campus, as well as within campus reduced by 33% overnight. 33%. Wow. Okay. And, yeah. and when campus returned to normal operations, the phone usage stayed the same. It did not increase. It, actually, it is probably since that time to this past year, it probably dropped another 5%. Oh my gosh. So all of us who dislike phone calls, we this is our moment, right? This yeah. Is, yes. Yeah. And, and those phone calls that we do receive, 90% of them go to voicemail. So we have we have a very expensive answer machine right now. Wow. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, it's for it to collect mostly vendor calls, right? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. So uh, can you talk a little bit about you know, some of those numbers, how many lines on campus and what do we know number wise, what the usage looks like now? Yes, it, it is very, very lightly used throughout campus. So we have uh, approximately 7,900 lines on campus, um, excluding our call centers, uh, like the Morrison, uh, the golf course, uh, 60, 60 lines average making and or receiving more than 10 calls a day. 10 calls a day on 60, 60 of 7,900. Yeah. And, yeah. Le and less than 150 make and or receive more than five calls a day. So wow. phones disappearing is not going to be a bad thing. I mean, it, <laughs> yeah. there are too many people that it sounds like will really notice. Uh, yes and no, uh -huh. because it, you had asked about what our, our challenges are. Mm -hmm. So the second challenge is with the phones, even though they are not used, we are emotionally tied to our phones. Mm. And uh, we saw this firsthand when when we removed the phones in the ITC a year ago, May. Uh, and uh, one individual was adamant that they needed their phone. Mm -hmm. And when I asked them when was the last time they received a call on it, they said it was two weeks prior to that. <laughs> so, yep. but, but it's just that emotional attachment. And and uh, so that will be a challenge. And, and, and honestly, I think it's, it's that emotional attachment is going to be a generational thing. The younger generation, I don't think is, is going to be uh, as big of a challenge as, as the older generation. Mm -hmm. Cause they grew up yeah. with the cut yes. cord. They already, yes. they, <laughs> yes. they don't know the world with exactly. the stretchy modems and they don't know the world. With, yeah. 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 Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. My kids have, have no idea of it. I was actually just showing uh, uh, this picture to Matt Smith uh, uh, the other day is cause we were talking about, uh, San Antonio and, and Educause. And I showed him a picture of my kids. Uh, uh, they were all, I think our oldest was in, in her twenties at the time, but they were all upper, upper teens or early twenties. And, and there was a hotel that had a, a bank of payphones, and they were absolutely, <laughs> oh boy. they were absolutely amazed. So I have a picture of them in the payphone. What is Call, this museum? Yeah. They're like calling each other, just yep. uh, amazed by it. So. <laughs> but I mean, to, for, for the folks who are still like using their phones attached to them, yeah. When phones came out of the ITC, talk a little bit about, you know, just some of those listening sessions. And so, there's a really big change management effort here to make sure that those folks are going to be seen, right? And looked yes. after. Can you tell us a little so, bit about that? I was, was going to say not only seen, but heard. Yeah. We, we need to, yeah, that feedback from, from people is is critical. And, uh, and we are, we want to hear the feedback from people and, and how people are feeling about it. And, and we want to work with them to help them uh, through this change because yeah, it, it, it will be a, a, a challenge. 
and and I know you've identified some areas, some kinds of roles that yeah. will just keep their phones. That we yeah. know that right off offhand. Can you yeah. give us some of that list? Yeah, yeah, very very similar to to wire connections for computers. There's there's a need for physical phones in certain locations. Uh, I mentioned more sin and 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 in the golf course. Obviously, they do, but. Classrooms, we have to have phones in classrooms. I mean, mm -hmm. we we can't have a soft phone on a computer and a computer. Uh, professors having a problem with the computer and they're relying on that to mm -hmm. call for help. Well, that's little, one way to little, cut down yeah, on the calls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, maybe maybe we Unplug should. Unplug it. Yeah. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, cl classrooms we're going to keep it, and, and uh, labs we're going to keep uh, phones. It's it's critical in, in labs. Areas where life safety, we need to make sure we're keeping phones there. Um, admins who are managing multiple different lines who need to keep physical phones there. And, and, but even if they're not managing multiple lines, you're still talking about like a department admin, yeah, the folks that yeah, staff the so, desks. Yeah. 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 We're, we're, mm. we're, 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 people are truly using their phones. Yeah. We're yeah. going to, we're, we're going to keep those phones. Yeah. Um, what are we replacing phones with? What, what are people supposed to use? Uh, it actually, it could be, it could be a, a variety of different things, but the vast majority are going to be with soft phones. So it's a, an application what is soft phone. It is an application is that? to that will run on your computer that when your office phone will ring a there will be a pop-up window and depending on if you have the audio set or, or not your your ring will come through your computer and you can click the button to answer the call as it, just as if you were picking up the phone uh, as well as if you want to make a call just tap on the icon put in the, the number or type in the person's name if it's here on campus and place the phone call. Uh, you can also, if you choose to put that same cell phone app on your cell phone, and in essence, it's, you would have the option of making and receiving calls on your cell phone using your cell phone number or making and receiving calls on your cell phone using your office number. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so there's no, for, you know, folks that are, are concerned about using their cell phone for yeah. work things, yeah. you're not giving out your cell number. Correct. This is all based on your work phone number. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Cool. Yeah. So, so you, and, we have a phone number. So then what is the service? Who are, who are we using for this? Where are we getting our phone numbers? Uh, so we are going, uh, transitioning to WebEx calling. Uh, yeah. we, we, we did a, uh, an RFP this past year evaluated, um, multiple different uh, cloud vendors. Uh, we had it narrowed down to Zoom and WebEx Calling uh, and ultimately selected WebEx Calling. Um, there was there was a, a, a compelling reason to go to Zoom. Uh, there I probably underlying that was the desire, that was the hope where we were going to go to. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I know a lot just, of people would say it just makes a ton of sense. We're yes. already using Zoom yeah. for yeah. video conferencing. It, it, Let's just use it for the phone. Yes, yeah. yes, it make it makes perfect sense. It mm -hmm. makes perfect sense. Uh, but the the reality of the situation was at the end of the day with the RFP and with uh, Zoom and WebEx calling being the finalists. Uh, despite going back to Zoom three different times, asking them to sharpen their pencils, they were twice the cost of WebEx calling. Oh and, my gosh. And kind of getting back to the, uh, the, the stats of the web, uh, the phone usage, it's, it's very difficult to justify that cost for a service that in essence is, is dying as a whole. Right. Um, and, uh, the feedback we received on, uh, from different areas on campus that was involved in the evaluation of the products was that the features and the usability was was virtually the same between WebEx calling and Zoom. Maybe a slight edge to Zoom, which is probably uh, largely impacted by our the comfort level of Zoom mm -hmm. because we use it for for conferencing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, what are some of the features that we can see with WebEx calling? Some of the biggest features is, is just that flexibility. You're able to to access your your phone no matter where you're at. Mm. Um, as well as um, added features with the um, um, voicemail. So today you can get your voicemail in a in a, in an email, but mm -hmm. it also WebEx calling calling will also transcribe it. So you can oh cool uh, you can actually uh, see see the message without actually playing it. I oh, love that's that. Great. Yeah, I love. I read that. it so much faster than I listen. Yeah, I, I was just going to say there's there's considering the 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 calls I get are, are mostly. Uh, or virtually all sales calls. It, yeah, I, I'm able to quickly look at the first couple lines. Yep, nope, delete. Delete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and don't even have to waste the, the time listening to it. 
Uh, one of the another additional feature with this is uh, is everyone's probably familiar with this is when you place a call off campus, you have to dial eight and then the number. Uh, that will no longer be the case with WebEx calling. You'll be able to just dial the dial the number as as if you're uh, like just like you like, do everywhere like else, like your normal phone. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Because then everything is yeah. off campus essentially. Yes. 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 Yeah. Excellent. Um, so, I mean, if we're going with, you know, WebEx as, as our, our, our soft phone solution, so where does that leave Jabber? I know there are several folks using that right now, but... Yeah. And they love it. <laughs> Jokingly. <laughs> no, they don't. No, they don't. Uh, everyone, hopefully, uh, hopefully we can hear a cheer on this, but Jabber is going away. It is no more. That's, and when when does that happen? Is has that happened? Is it happening? So it, 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 it it is happening. We were um, we have a, a handful of people right now piloting early adopters with WebEx calling, mm -hmm. uh, and we are going to uh, begin rolling it out uh, to a smaller uh, smaller population. Uh, HR was one of them. We were actually going to do it in October, um, and uh, uh, we have pushed that to November as is kind of. The realization on all of us was, oh yeah, with open enrollment going going on, oh, yeah. that probably mm. is not the right time to to transition HR to a new phone system. So no, but that's still very soon. That's, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, that's great. And then we will uh, full force start the rollout for all of campus um, starting in January, uh, and we expect it to be about a year and a half effort to to do this. Yeah. So okay, how much does each individual phone line? right now costs like the hard desk phones the hard uh, hard desk phones uh it, i i could not uh, i don't remember off the top of my head the specific hard desk phone uh, uh cost but i can tell you that that the university spends approximately hundred thousand dollars a year simply replacing physical phones replace Wait, keeping just up replacing? with that? just replacing physical phones wow so and and what I and, mean, and, and, what kind of cycle and, would that be on? I mean, are we replacing twenty percent a year? Are we doing it's uh, uh, probably probably about fifteen percent. And oh my when Man. when everyone really returned full force to campus uh, uh, after COVID, it was there was even a greater number that initial year because yeah. people people were gone home for for a year plus and then returned and lo and behold, their their phones were were dead. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so are, are we as we replace uh desk phones um is there any any space where we're going to be talking about people getting other equipments i mean i know i i personally you know i you know when i'm on zoom and stuff i've got a pair of headphones on um are we going to be recommending anything or we're certainly not requiring anybody to do anything like this but correct yeah we're we are we are currently uh kind of re uh, rethinking this this approach so as as uh, we first started having these conversations with the university leadership talking about uh, the idea of wireless first and, and soft phones uh, the feedback we received was well there really isn't a, a need to provide like headsets for people because uh, people are already using zoom so whatever they're doing for their audio uh, for for zoom they should be able to do for their their phones as well uh, but in, in further conversations with with folks, is we are uh, we are now kind of rethinking that, and we're going to identify kind of what the recommended wired as well as a, a Bluetooth solution mm. would be. So if if uh, users or departments want to have a, a head a headset that they currently don't, we'll have a recommend recommendation mm. for them. That's a very interesting perspective, and not one I thought of before. Yeah. I mean, we are living in Zoom already, and yeah. I guess so. If you're yeah, if you're already yeah do without, yeah. then yeah. you're but, probably going to be satisfied the same way. Yeah. But it, there, I, I could see there, there being use cases where people may feel that a phone call may be feel more private. So they may, they may be perfectly comfortable using the, uh, the audio on their computer for a zoom, but a phone call, they might want to be a little bit more private. So there might yes. be a, might be a use case for that. Yeah. 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 So we, we touched on this a little bit with, removing wired connections, but how, how do we verify that someone is on the list of getting to keep their desktop phone? Um, so, um, I, I think as it, as it relates to like classrooms and, and stuff like that, I think it's pretty, pretty clear cut. Um, as far as in admins, I think it's pretty mm -hmm. clear cut as far as uh, high usage areas, people are on there. 
that will be part of the, uh, the, the conversations we have as we start rolling this out. It is, as we go into departments or buildings, it's not going to simply go in there and we're not going to just grab all the phones. <laughs> the, the, yeah, SWAT style, yeah, right? Yeah, and, and, and walk out. It, it's, it, there's going to be conversations. Yes, there, there will be conversations conversations leading into it and, and making sure that that uh, we're on the same page with, with the tenants uh, of the building or the department and, and uh, in agreement what we're doing. Excellent. Great. I could just see this though. Look out. Here comes telephony services. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Everyone. Uh, Black masks. And... Yeah. Put, put your phone in your, in your drawer. <laughs> nope. No, nope, I don't have one. No, I don't have a phone. <laughs> nope. Cool. So all of these changes, John, I, I, uh, I can imagine, you know, as our global presence, you know, continues to grow in things. The one question folks would have is, is this main campus only? Will we see this in London or Rome or any of the other places we're going? What, what's the scope of this project right now? So the, the scope currently is just for central main campus. Um, we would be happy to entertain it in, in remote locations. Uh, currently that's the, the infrastructure for those areas were, were not, uh, centrally funded to, to maintain mm. that. So th there would be need to be some improvements in there to, to support it. Um, so we would be happy to with additional funding. Uh, but so the current, current point, we're just focusing on campus. Okay. okay. But, no. but, but a lot of what we'll learn on campus will actually make it easier. I would envision for, yeah. for remote locations. Oh, that's true. Well, and for people traveling, certainly. I mean, as, yes. as we've moved to laptops as the standard for, for yes. computers, and it's just one more one more step in that direction, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, we, we live in a, a very mobile world, so we need to, mm -hmm. yeah. no matter where you're at, things just, just work. It's it, it truly, I've had this conversation with uh, Shannon uh, multiple times, and, and Jag, while, while he was here, is it, it truly is, it's just the utility similar to mm -hmm. you walk into a room and turn on a light switch. You, you expect the lights to work. It's, mm -hmm. it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Spe speaking of stuff working, what kind of resources do we have for folks getting used to the new tool? Like, do we have like how to videos? What, what can they do to uh, learn more about WebEx calling, figure out, you know, what they need? Yeah, we are, there's how to videos being created as well as similar to the, the, uh, the, the wireless side, we are reviewing and going through all of knowledge base articles uh, to make sure that they're concise and clear and uh, simple to follow uh, for those how to's mm -hmm. and, and troubleshooting. I, I know we've heard for a long time um, about the idea of lighting up the green spaces on campus. And so far, you've just talked about what we're doing inside the buildings. What are the plans for us to to go outdoors with this? Yeah, we are in the process. So we in this past year, uh, we initially focused on uh, uh, the patios around the residential halls. Uh, students have been asking for this for, mm -hmm. for years to be able to go out on their patios and, and be able to, to maintain connectivity. So we have, uh, this past year, we deployed that there. Uh, we have deployed um, Wi-Fi in the library quad. Um, no. And this coming year, uh, we're focusing on the uh, additional patio spaces, like outside Grace and Flanner, and between DeBartolo and and Duncan Student and um, Joyce and uh, Compton and and Corbett and a few other patios that slip in my mind right now. But yeah. focus on that as as well as uh, assuming we get years three and four funded, uh, the uh, additional green space areas. Um, I was actually uh, talking again with with uh, Mike this past week. I was pleasantly surprised the the Wi-Fi that we put in the library quad. I wasn't sure how it was going to hold up uh, during a game day with so many All people right. there and overrunning it. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised at how well it held up, even with that amount of people there. Nice, oh, it's fabulous. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have one last question. And it pertains to all of wireless first. So we, we talked a lot about how, you know, this this has to do with moving toward the needs that we have now, um, which makes us think about the needs of the future and positioning the university to have a successful future, right? So what would happen if instead of doing wireless first and instead of um, removing wired connections and removing phones and enforcing or uh, enhancing Wi-Fi, what, what would happen? What would happen if we did nothing? <laughs> Uh, in, in essence, what would happen is our costs would 
increase uh, as well as our support needs would would increase. Um, I touched on our, our 100 gig to a, an endpoint goal is is to be able to accomplish that. It, it will be a far greater funding ask that uh, I would have to put in to to be able to support that. Um, to to continue to to support both wired and, and Wi-Fi at the the current levels would as as the campus continues to grow uh, will only escalate that that cost and with with that comes people. So mm -hmm. um, it, I mean we would be able to to continue down the path. It just it requires more resources. So it all gets back to being good stewards of the university's yeah, resources and 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 using using uh, uh, an appropriate. Uh, solution where we're needed, but uh, as well as just allowing people to be flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we we talked about we're a mobile society, so let's let's support that. Yeah, that's good. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. We could probably move on to more fun stuff now. Yeah, not yeah. that wireless first isn't fun. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's fun. It what are you saying? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's not what I meant. That's what you saying. <laughs> The website is especially fun. Yes. So if people get to visit that, <laughs> it looks amazing. Very talented yes. graphic artist helped I, us. I, I, I would wholeheartedly agree. All right. It's time for Consultant Quirks, where we ask our guests a few fun rapid fire questions. So, John, what, which fictional character do you identify most with? Uh, that, I think that would be a pretty simple question or answer for me is it would have to be Woody from Toy Story. That what makes you, sense. And why? Wait, no. Why does that make sense? No, I don't know. I don't know. John gives the, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. so this goes back oh, probably 15, 20 years ago. Hall Halloween one year, and and the kids say, uh, yeah, I want, I want you to dress up and as we go out trick or treating. And so, for whatever reason, it just decided on Woody, and lo and behold. I look exactly like Woody <laughs> when I dress as Woody. <laughs> so, it, and it, it, it actually, uh, to, if you asked uh, my youngest, Ava, she still every once in a while will call me Woody. Oh, <laughs> oh that's awesome. So. That's awesome, it, for sure. If you could have dinner with any person, real or fictional, living or dead, who would it be and why? Ah, there's a, a lot of a, a lot of people I would like to, to have dinner with. Uh, but if if I could pick one, it would have to be my grandfather. Oh, um, that's sweet. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. What did your What did your grandfather mean to you? Why 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 Why, why dinner? Uh, he. Um, it, it would. I would love to to be able to sit down with him. Uh, he was. He was a, a very very special man, and, and both my grandfather and my and my dad are are instrumental in who I've become, and um, they were, they were are and were uh, very giving men and would do anything to, to help somebody out and just both of their work ethics uh, and um, having the opportunity to, to sit down with him and letting him see who I became. I, I would hope he would be, be proud of that, but love to be able to, to uh, for him to see that and uh, would love to be able to tell him everything he's missed and, Tell him about his grandkids and oh. and uh, and and more important, uh, I guess not really more important, but to him it might be more important. Um, he was a true diehard Cubs fan. He oh. he uh, he he was he's the reason I became a Cubs fan. I remember at a very very early age he was uh, he was a farmer and riding around on the tractor with him, and we were listen to Cubs games on the transistor radio and, and he, he's how I became a Cubs fan and and would love to be able to share with him that yes we did it and, of course and, yes. and I, I still remember that that night that we won is sitting there and that was that was the thoughts and the emotion running through is just like I, I wish he was sitting here with me yeah yeah, yeah definitely and and you know when, when you mentioned about like you know look, look at look at what what we've done look at this beautiful family yeah. so so many things so yeah. many things yeah what book would you recommend everyone read and why uh, my favorite book that i and i routinely go back and and reread it as a as a reminder is extreme ownership um it's written by uh, and i always mess up his last name but uh jocko i think it's willick 
Um, he is a retired Navy SEAL leader. Uh, and uh, the book is, it talks about tr what it truly means to, to own something and how it goes uh, beyond just directing and um, leading, but truly, and taking accountability, but truly owning it. And, and a lot of it goes back to, and what I touched on earlier is, is the why of wireless first is mm -hmm. the most important uh, piece to truly owning something is first yourself understanding why and being able to help others understand why. And that is the difference the majority of the time between success and, and failure. And he, he gives uh, several examples in the book talking about it. I also had the opportunity to, to listen to him uh, speak live and, uh, he, he gave specific examples in, out in, in warfare where he would direct people and it became a disaster and it would dawn on him afterwards like, oh, they don't understand why I'm asking them to do this. And soon as he explained that to them and they understood that, it was the difference between success and failure and more important, the difference between life and death. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, John, thank you so much for chatting with us today. This has been a real pleasure. No, I, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. All right. It's time for our tech tips and tricks. At this point in the show, we will highlight tips and tricks that we learn from you, our listeners. We'd love to hear your ideas. Simply email them to btspodcast at indie.edu. So our tip today is one we talked last, uh, last time a little bit about FastPass, and this one uh, is related to that. Uh, this specifically for for Mac users. Um, do you have Touch ID on your laptop, or you 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 don't have access to it? Maybe you've got your laptop closed and can't can't get to the button. Uh, your Apple Watch will also work to allow you in. It's uh, as a biometric device. If both your Mac and your Apple Watch are connected to the same Apple ID, you can actually configure your watch. To unlock your Mac and by you know, and that way you're allowing your watch to be used as the biometric. So what you can work with the I, laptop this closed. Is the first or I've that heard is, of that. Oh, yeah. well, I worked on that project and still wasn't aware of that. That's awesome. I, was just saying, I never, <laughs> I never knew that. What, does it work the same with like the iPhone? If you had it on your iPhone, do I, you know, I the the watch and the iPhone. You, no, no, or yeah. with the iPhone, iPhone and the iPhone Mac. and the Mac. I don't know. I don't mm. think that does, but yeah. hope maybe one of our listeners can answer that for next time. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah. But that is a, a very That's good really tip. That's really cool. If you've got ideas about any of the topics that we covered today or anything else, just email those ideas to btspodcast at nd.edu. If there's anything else new, exciting, frustrating, or inspiring happening in your IT consultancy world, please share that with us too. We would love to hear your insights and ideas. Next time, we'll speak with Jessica Brubaker-Horst and Tracy Frank to discuss how they provide IT consulting services to Notre Dame Athletics. Until then, thank you for listening. Thanks, everyone. Signing off from Behind the Screens, IT at ND. Stay tech savvy, Notre Dame. connections uh, for not only their their computer but their TVs and everything else and oh yes the uh, alert oh yeah